Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, if you have your notes, go ahead and take them out. If you don't have notes, shame on you. No, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, but if you don't have your notes, or if you want to follow along, along in your scripture, take out your Bibles and open up to Matthew chapter 17. Uh, it'll also be provided on the PowerPoint behind me. It's hard to work with a dull or worn out tool, isn't it? When they're worn out, when they're dirty, dull, or when you go to reach for that drill and it's dead, or the stuff that you're going for is broken into pieces because it wasn't well taken care of, well oiled, that's just frustrating, isn't it? It's just frustrating. They might work, too, right? Right? You might be able to get that drill to, to, to do a little bit of a hole for you. It's going to start going, mm. and then you have to pull it out, mm. right? That's what always happens, and it's always when you're in the middle of a big project. So you go and you put it in the charger for, you know, and you're counting down two minutes. Two minutes should be a good enough charge, right? And then you bring it back, and mm. so frustrating. So frustrating. Tools that wear out are never as good at their job as they were before until you do some maintenance on them. Until you put them into charge. The same is for our spiritual life or just our regular life in general. We can get dull and dirty. We get tired and just in need of a recharge, can't we? Why? Because the day-to-day wears on us. There's a story of two lumberjacks. I love this story. You may have heard it. One of the lumberjacks was quite older than the other, and the younger lumberjack came, and he was like, you know what, this guy set the record for the most trees chopped, so I'm going to challenge this old guy. Wanted to show up, that guy. So he went up to the older lumberjack, And he said, I heard you hold the record. That's right, son. He goes, well, I challenge you today, right now, because I want to show everybody that I'm going to be the new top dog here. The old guy said, no problem. Let's go. Let's go right now, and we'll start chopping trees. So they both go out. They have the exact same axe. They have the exact same amount of trees before them, and they go, and they start chopping. Chop, 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 chop. And then the young guy noticed that as... The day kept on going, the old man would sit down and he would take a break after a couple hours. He would take a, about a half hour break in between chops. And he goes, man, I am so going to whoop this old man. He's too old. He can't handle this pressure anymore. His bones are too sore. His, his arms ache. He's chopping, chopping, chopping. Sweat's just pouring out of him. He knows he's defeated this old guy. Because sure enough, he looks over his shoulder again. And he's sitting down again. He goes, man, he just can't handle it. Chop, chop, chop. Both of them going. Looks over his shoulder again. There's the old man again. He's sitting there and he's, he's like, man, this guy just, he's, he's seen his best days behind him. I'm defeating the king. Well, at the end of the day, they're standing before the piles. The young guy notices that the old man's got more wood in his pile than him. More trees falling. He goes, no, 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 this can't be, this can't be. I saw you sit down. I saw, I didn't take a break all day. I chopped all day long. There's no way that your pile should be bigger than mine. There's no way that you cut more trees down. They start tallying him up, and sure enough, the old guy beat him by a third more trees. The young guy was furious. How in the world? I saw you sit down for an hour, sometimes a half hour, sometimes more than an hour. 
The old guy said, well, that thing that you thought I was doing, taking a break to rest my weary bones, as I heard you say once, I was sharpening my axe. Because I couldn't possibly cut through so many trees without having a sharp axe. So in between each time I would fall a bunch of trees, I, I knew about eight trees in that I'd have to sit and I'd have to resharpen. And I took as long as needed to make sure that thing was nice and sharp and ready to keep on going. Oh yeah, you spent a lot more time and a lot more energy than I did. But you weren't focused. You weren't sharpened. You were going at it with a dull tool. And brothers and sisters, a lot of us put in a lot of hard work, but we have dull axes. We're wondering why the trees aren't falling the same way that they did before. We're going to church. We're serving. We're studying our Bible. We're praying. But it seems like our spiritual walk is at a standstill. The trees aren't falling like they used to. We're having a lot more spiritual lows than we are having spiritual highs. We're hitting the valleys a lot harder and a lot longer than we are the, the, the spiritual mountains that we're just excited to see take place in our life. And we're wondering, why is this happening? And I'll tell you, we're going to work with dull axes. We don't have our, to our tools sharpened, charged, ready to go. That's where we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 17. Take out your Bibles, Matthew chapter 17, starting in verse 14. Matthew 17, starting in verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and very ill. Now, a lot of you guys are saying, amen, my son's a lunatic too, but that's not the type of lunatic it's talking about here. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, verse 16, and they could not cure him. Jesus answered, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked him, and a demon came out of the boy, and the boy was cured at once. The disciples came up to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? Jesus, why, why couldn't we do this? Verse 20, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible to you. Verse 21, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and by fasting. Jesus returns from the Mount of Transfiguration. We have to give a little background here. Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were with him. They've just seen Jesus in all his glory. That's what the transfiguration part of the mount is. Jesus has just revealed himself to them. 
He's been on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. They've been talking. They heard God speak and say, This is my son, and who am I am well pleased. Whenever I hear that, think of that voice, I always think of it in Charlton Heston's voice for some reason. <laughs> this is my son, you know? So they just hear Charlton Heston speak from heaven. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus reveals himself in all his glory. And they come down. You've got to imagine the spiritual high these guys are on. They are spiritually charged and excited and ready to go. Any challenge they'll take. Ooh. And they are faced with a challenge, aren't they? We see that as soon as they get down... A couple verses later, about, about two verses later, verse 16, after coming down from the mountain, they're faced with the challenge of a demon. And they cannot cast it out. They try to cast out the demon out of the child, and the, the, the demon will not leave. In fact, verse 16 distinctly says, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. So what happened? What happened in those just few verses where they see Jesus and they hear the, the voice of God speaking? What happened in that time? I mean, they were spiritually charged and ready to go. Or so they thought. And so they, they grabbed Jesus privately. Verse 19 says, they grab Jesus privately and they, and they come up to him and they say, what happened? Why couldn't we do this? You, you spoke and, and it was gone. We tried and nothing happened. Why, Jesus? I mean, we are with you. We were with, I was on the mountain. It was exciting. Moses and Elijah were there. God spoke from heaven. Why? Why couldn't we cast out the demon? Why was this spiritual stronghold too big for us? Too strong for us? Why couldn't we? And that's when the question gets an unexpected answer. Mountains will not move. Spiritual strongholds will not crumble. Growth cannot occur until, number one, you give it to God. And then you have to sharpen your axe. Until you've spiritually spent time in focus and fasting. You can't physically do what needs to be done spiritually. In other words, their issue was a spiritual issue, and they approached it from the physical side of things. There are needs that are too great. Obstacles that have a whole different dimension and difficulty to them. Some things require a specific breakthrough that only God can provide, only God can give, so we have to go to Him, the spiritual side of things. Some things need us to step away physically and step in spiritually. Jesus says here there was a, a, just a breakthrough that needed to happen. A breakthrough. Number one, godly prayer with fasting. And it will release a breakthrough of spiritual power. The disciples were spiritually unable to do battle. Yes, they were excited after seeing Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, but they were not ready. They were not ready to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Why? Because their opponent was fiercer than they had ever faced. Their opponent was stronger than they had ever seen. In fact, we get the, the word that it says here, this kind, in verse 21. 
This word, this kind, it's speaking of a particular type of demon. This particular species cannot be expelled just with you talking. You can't just go up to it and say, hey, how you doing? Get out. And when the battle is fierce, you cannot go at it with a dull axe, brothers and sisters. You can't rely on yesterday's success to win today's victories. You can't say, well, yesterday we casted out the demons. Jesus, why can't we today? Yesterday I had a great devotion, Jesus. Why can't I take some of that into today? Yesterday was a great prayer time. What about today? I remember a year ago I led so many people to Christ. We can't hang on to yesterday's successes for today's victories in Christ. Sometimes we face a stronger opponent than we can physically go after and bear. And we need spiritual strength to move that mountain. The key to overcoming, the key to overcoming what we can't do physically comes in the answer spiritually. The missing ingredient of what's missing in our life in that moment that we just don't see a breakthrough. We don't see a change. We've hit the spiritual plateau and we can't get to the next level. We just, we're not growing. It seems like we're praying and God's not listening. It seems like we haven't really been getting anything from our, our prayer life or our, our reading of Scripture, our study life. We need to sharpen our axe in prayer, and fasting. The key ingredient is the spiritual ingredient. Think of the examples that we see in Scripture. Think of some of the examples you can just think of off the top of your head in Scripture. In Acts 14, when, when the church is trying to pick out the elders that will run the church, that will guide the church, that will be the overseers and the shepherds of the next church, they needed a spiritual breakthrough because they didn't want to choose just based on the physical side of things. So they go to God in prayer and in fasting. In Acts chapter 13, when they're trying to figure out who the apostles should send, who, who should we send out as to, to reach the lost for us? It says that they worshipped, they prayed, and they fasted. Because these are things that need a spiritual breakthrough. When Jonah is sitting in, in Jonah chapter 3 feeling remorse for his disobedience, he's inside the belly of the whale, or excuse me, the fish. It wasn't a whale. Fish. When he's sitting in the belly of the fish, it says that he felt remorse for his disobedience to God. And when he felt that he needed to restore that relationship, you know what he did? Say it with me. He prayed and he fasted. It was something that he couldn't do on his own. God, forgive me. I forgive me. There we go. I'm good. No. He needed God's forgiveness and guidance. He wanted to have that relationship restored. So it was prayer and fasting that provided the breakthrough, the sharpening that he needed in his life. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is about to start his earthly ministry here. Jesus is about to start a three-year journey that would ultimately lead to his death on a cross. He's about to start the beginning of the three-year journey that would create a separation in a moment when the sins of the earth would pour onto him. He would feel a void between him and the Father that he had never had before. And he knew it. And what does it say? He spent time in prayer 
and fasting. In Ezra chapter 8, fast was for God to create a clear path for the nation of Israel's journey. All these things we can't achieve on our own. We can't achieve God's forgiveness for the sins and the, and the failures in our life on our own. We can't ask for a clear path spiritually on our own. We can't ask for these things that God wants to provide on our own. We have to go to Him for prayer and for fasting, for sharpening. Fasting is the deliberate abstinence of physical gratification to achieve a spiritual goal. It's the denial of the flesh to gain a response spiritually. Fasting saying, my needs are better met by God than anything this world could give. It's saying, no to yourself so you can come alive to God spiritually. I don't need food because my God's word is food enough for my soul. When you eat, who do you eat for? Let's put it in this context. When you eat, who do you eat for? Are you eating for the person next to you? I wish it worked that way, because, man, I would just feast on ice cream all the time. Some of you ladies make that as your excuse. I'm eating for two. I need ten cheeseburgers, please. That's cheating. That's not fair. I can't get away with that. But other than being pregnant, all right, we'll put that stipulation in there. When we eat, who do we eat for? I guarantee you it's for no one else but yourself. I guarantee you that when you eat, you don't think of somebody else in mind. Let's take it to another level. When you eat, are you always hungry? Oh, now people are saying, no, pastor, come on now. That's not fair. We're not always hungry when we eat. We're just doing it because we like food. We don't really need a bowl of ice cream, do we? No. What, what is dessert for anyway? Right? We've just eaten a giant meal, and then we're like, you know it would be great after this gigantic meal? More food. An appetizer. What is that? You know what's going to be great? Let's have food before we eat food, and then we'll end it with some more food. We don't need all that. But we eat it because we like it. Right? It tastes great. That's why we're eating it. And we eat it for no one other than me, myself, and I. We eat it for our pleasure. Because it stimulates our tongue sensories. And we're excited. This is great food. Food satisfies us. It satisfies us physically. It gets us excited because we're like, man, this is a great steak or this is the best, you know, boil de pancha I've ever had or anything like that, you know. Uh, whatever it may be, whatever your fix is, you're just like, this is great. I need that. But fasting satisfies the spiritual hunger for God. See, we eat to satisfy our physical hunger. Or just the fact that we want to taste something great. And when we fast, it's the cry of our soul that we're feeding. It's the thirst and the hunger within that's being fed. Because as Jesus says in Matthew 4.4, 4, no one shall live on bread alone, but of every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So when you fast, you're actually feeding your spiritual life because you get into God's word. It's that moment when that hunger hits your stomach. You say, you know what? Now's the time I should fill with God's word. And you turn to God's word and you read it and you say, ooh, this is so much more filling than any steak or burger could do. 
Don't get me wrong, it's good to fast from TV. Okay, I've seen those TV fasts, they're good. Phone fasts, those are fantastic. But spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, fasting is from food. When Jesus fasted, he didn't fast from the internet. Okay, he didn't go 40 days without the internet. It doesn't say that. He went 40 days with no food in his belly. When Daniel sat there praying and fasting for the nation Israel, he didn't say, you know what, I'm going to cut off Facebook for a little while. Guys, I'm, I'm signing off. I'm going on a spiritual fast here. It was food. Guys, the other are good. We should do those. We should get off the internet. We should get out of movies. We should do those things. We need to get out of those things every once in a while because they take over our life and they separate us from God a lot of times. But the thing that was scriptural that God calls us to remember and to feed our life in spiritually is from food. Cut it off for a little while. Hunger for Him. Thirst for Him. I need spiritual food, not physical food. I need attention from God that only Him and His Word can provide. And this is what is, Jesus is telling His disciples in Matthew chapter 17. Sharpen your spiritual life through prayer and fasting for hungering for God's word, for hungering for growth. To jumpstart those spiritual lows that happen in your life. To conquer the strongholds in your life that you can't diminish on your own. To get out of the weakness of your faith, because it says it, you guys had weak faith. To conquer the weakness of your faith, get into prayer and fasting, because that's when things start to happen. That's when things start to move. If you want the impasses in life to be done away with, if you want to say to the mountain, move. If you mount the mountains to jump into the ocean, as it says. If you're seeking spiritual strength. Feast on the Lord. Feast on His Word in prayer and in fasting. I got a family challenge that I think all of you guys know where we're going with this one. A lot of you guys are getting uncomfortable saying, Pastor, you're going to tell me not to eat. For those of you that already had the crock pot going, don't worry, it's not today. Join me in fasting. On Wednesday, April 5th, this Wednesday, go a day without solid food. Go one day without solid food. If you want to take it longer, that's fine too. Spend the time that you would dedicate to eating at lunch, at breakfast, at dinner, those in-between times when you're snacking, feasting on God's Word. Spend those times talking to God in prayer. Spend those times opening up the Bible and saying, God, guide me and lead me because I want to jumpstart my relationship with you. I want to sharpen my axe so those spiritual strongholds come crumbling down in my life. Spend time in God's word and study, hungering for him. Because just like your physical life gets hungry and you get low blood sugar and you get hangry, you know, and you can't have people around when you're hungry because you're going to be yelling at them. Your spiritual life gets hungry too. And you can't live on bread alone. Now if you have some health issues and it kind of, you know, how do I do this? Talk to your doctor. They, most of the times they have plans for something like that. But join me this Wednesday. The entire church, join. I'm giving you plenty of time to plan it out. And then pray with me. Because it said, this kind does not come, these, this overcoming spiritually does not, does not happen without prayer and fasting. So pray with me. 
on Wednesday, pray with me for spiritual strongholds in your own life to come crumbling down. That whatever has been stopping you from growing in Christ would be taken out, would be removed. Whatever stumbling block there is that you keep on falling over in temptation, that Jesus would conquer. And then pray for the same for those that are in this room. Pray for your brothers and sisters in this room that whatever is hanging them up, they'd be able to have a breakthrough. Pray for the strongholds to come down. And then pray for our church. Pray for our church that the bounds of growth and giving would be broken open. Pray for this church. And then pray that Satan will not be able to stand against what the Lord is doing here. That Satan and his demons and his activity will not be able to stand against what God is doing in this church's life, in my life, in the life of the staff here, and that no stronghold can stand up to what God wants to do. Amen? And then pray for your life and where God wants to direct you. In the back, I've provided a, a, some packets in the rear. It's got a little yellow sign. Take those, and this week, read over them. It's just four interesting thoughts for fasting. Four scriptures that give a little bit of insight. Brothers and sisters, don't keep trying to work spiritually without sharpening your axe, without recharging and spending time with God in prayer and fasting. Let's go to the Lord, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, and Lord, I pray that the strongholds in our life will come down. That whatever is standing in our way, whatever mountain spiritually is standing there and not letting us grow in you, that we just crumble the sound of your name. Lord, that every time we stand before you, we stand in your presence, just in love with what you've done for us, in love with the amazingness that is Jesus. That, Lord, your church would not crumble because we have not sharpened ourselves. We have not grown in faith. We've shied back, Lord. Lord, we pray that we would spend this time this week dedicating ourselves to you for this one day, Lord, in prayer and in fasting. And Lord, every time our stomach grumbles, Lord, that it'd be a reminder of how often our spirit grumbles to be fed to. So every day that we're giving to you in prayer and in fasting, every time our belly grumbles, Lord, let us pull out our word, which is yours, and feast. Lord, let this be what breaks open. Everything that needs to be conquered for the name of Christ. Whether it be our pride, whether it be our own growth with you, whether it be things in this church, Lord, that have been a long time needing to be let go. Whatever it may be, Lord, we just hand it over to you this week and ask that you would break through in our lives, in the lives of this church, in a great and mighty way.